Radio Network, and welcome to the Draft from the Circus program. My name is Frank Santoroski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk about this past weekend in racing and preview next week and catch up on all the uh, other racing news. Joining me, Louise Torres and Richard Uden, as always, fellas, how we doing? Good, thank you. Let's go, Mariners. Keep the streak going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So save that for our baseball podcast that we do on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which will be, I don't know, never released. Never released. Yep. yep. So uh, anyway, speaking of almost never, um, I mean, uh, the IndyCar has returned to the streets of Toronto Exhibition Place, one of the longer running street courses uh, in North America. It dates back to the 80s, uh, although we've not been there in two years due to uh, pandemic related um you know, complications, I guess, is a good way to put it. But uh, but we are back again. This is one, you know, after two years that you get the danger that, you know, maybe it'll it'll never happen again. But uh, sure enough, we were there. They had a decent attendance well down from from previous years. Um, my understanding is that they sold out all the grandstand seats, but there were significantly fewer grandstands uh, put up and they estimated <laughs> the weekend attendance at around 50,000, which for weekend attendance is that's a tiny bit light uh, from what we've seen in uh, Toronto in the past, but uh, not too shabby after a two year layoff uh, of bringing these guys back is the first time uh, folks in Toronto have seen the cars with the aero screens. It's the first time that 13 of the uh, drivers in the series have seen this track. Uh, so it was a, uh, you know, pretty good, pretty good run all around. Uh, at the end of the day, Scott Dixon is chalking up another win, number 52, which ties him with Mario Andretti for all-time uh, IndyCar wins. Um, and again, of course, then you know, whenever these sort of things happen, you get the comparisons made. Is oh, well, uh, Dixon never won on dirt, so he doesn't count. I mean, whatever. But, uh, you know, it just still makes the case for Scott Dixon being – perhaps the best driver of this generation, uh, which is absolutely, you know, hard to argue. Um, and the one thing he does have in common with Mario is the, uh, the Indy 500 win and the struggle to get a second one. Um, <laughs> as we've and seen, there's a, there's, a yeah, lot, yeah. there's a lot of them. And it's the notion, the n- notion of the dirt and all of that stuff. Well, um, third racing has been dropped out of the main Indy car championship trails of any, of all sorts of types for half a century exactly so exactly that's yeah, the thing I, I don't know why we're still putting up that argument that the and by the time yeah by the time it was half century mario was now concentrating in formula one at that time with the indy 500 being one of the other ones he does concentrate on right absolutely so but uh but either way great day for dixon he was uh you know, he was on a bit of a bit of a long drought for Dixon as far as he, as far as Dixon concerned. So he was able to end his drought. Of course, uh, Rossi's drought continues. Um, he's, uh, was running decently well until, uh, he got a little sloppy there and, and Felix Rosenqvist, uh, snuck on in there, gave him a little, give him a little bump and said, you know, Alex, uh, here's the Toronto wall. If you haven't seen it up close. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, so there's that there causing a little controversy even, and then, you know, no real mention in the post-race interviews when they talked to him, but uh, Felix made his way to the podium. Second place, Colton Herta, who um, historically now Herta, of course, won the pole uh, in grand fashion, um, flyer of a lap at the last minute, uh, well-earned pole there, uh, led the early stages of the race until he lost the lead to Dixon. And, and historically we've seen, uh, when Colton gets in these situations here, he he it often more often than not 
will make a mistake, but I uh, got to hand it to him that he held it together, held on for second place. Uh, despite the fact that he's, you know, like the next day, we've, I've, I hear the honest excuse for not uh, challenging that his, um, he said his, <laughs> he- his head sock failed and his hair was in his eyes. I'm like, okay, that's, uh, you know, Colton, there's no shame in losing a race to Scott Dixon, okay? <laughs> because this, it all sounds a little silly, but uh, yes, the, the young man does have quite long hair. And I've never heard of a uh, head sock failing, uh, although I prefer to, to use the term balaclava. Uh, just yeah. I've, I've always heard it called that growing up, but I've never heard of it failing. So uh, I just thought that was kind of a little interesting Side story there, but uh, you know, when all is said and done, Marcus Erickson still leading the points, but it's really tightened up, it's really tightened up uh, behind there. Um, because Award finished like 11th, Power finished 12th, uh, and then of course, Herta and Rosenquist got good finishes there. Graham Rahel came home fourth, which is his best finish of the year. So, uh, yeah, we've uh, we've got a real tight battle, uh, past the halfway point. So, Louise, what were some of your impressions of uh? getting back to the streets of Toronto. It felt weird when you talk about it. I don't know if it has anything to do with the long-term absence or attends or everything. It just felt weird seeing Toronto, you know, where where Rossi is the littlest things of attention of detail, ladies and gentlemen, when Rossi and Rosiquist tangle, I almost didn't recognize that corner because that one of those, because when you go to that long straight, when you go to the hard break, right, you usually see billboards over there and you see that, wrapped around the where the pedestrian bridge goes. There was none. I was thinking, wait a minute, did they change it? And then I realized, no, it's still the same corner. It just looks different and odd. But for Rosenquist to make contact, have that episode with his potential teammate next year, that will not, that will not bode well. And my initial start of thinking when I heard when I heard about this, was like, oh geez, there goes Rosenquist's IndyCar career is off the Formula E. He goes. But the fact that Rosicus was able to basically and essentially redeem himself to get a podium, a much needed one, where his future is up in the air in terms of work he's going to race. Unlike one other McLaren driver who may not race at all, we can dive into that later. But for Dixon to win it, long time coming, because I, we, I've been talking about it multiple times. That it's been since Texas, the first Texas race last May since he won. And he's been putting good finishes, but he has not been much of a contender to win races. He has to be. In fact, he's able to leave Toronto, go to the Iowa doubleheader with, with a win on, uh, on, his, on his belt. Crucial to, ha- for, to have any sliver of a chance of a championship because right now it looks like it's Erickson's to lose because there is that tight battle for second going to where one to where I feel like whoever exits Iowa, the doubleheader, with strong results, and they're able to cut some of the gap on Erickson, you're looking at them at being the guy to beat to beat him as he says. And if, it's, if Erickson has another solid result, barring any reliability issues or incidents that is out of his own doing, you still have Nashville coming up. You're looking at possibly Erickson running away with this title. So for Dixon to put up with a strong result, this title may not be quite over yet. But for guys like New Garden and Award to have a not so good point state, that is not ideal, especially for the Penske camp that started super strong, but all of a sudden consistency has to. It's, it's like they need to put a string of races like they did at the start again, because they haven't been doing so from time to time this season. They've been inconsistent, and also when you when power has a bad day, it usually ends up imploding. Having a not so good result when you're trying to win a championship in probably your best form you've ever been as a racer, it's not a good weekend for him at Toronto, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Power again. He got shafted in qualifying. He was on his flyer uh, when when the red came out and and had to abandon his lap with the closing moments. He wasn't able to advance in his qualifying session uh, when he had plenty of speed to do that. So once again. He's starting way in the back and he wasn't able to, you know, quite come through up, up as far as he did at say mid Ohio. He, I think, I believe he ended up 11th or 12th. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just seems like, and, and Will even said it, he said that, you know, once you, it starts with the bad qualifying. And then when you, you know, when you, when you qualify poorly for the, the one race, you get a, 
a less than ideal pit stall for the next race and it's just harder to, to break out of that cycle you're deeper in the field when these you know sort of things happen with the reds and whatnot but uh you know but i gotta hand it to will again he took it all in stride you know showing the you know extreme restraint and then not the willpower of old uh, who you know you know might be like uh throwing his helmet or, or giving somebody the bird uh but that uh, will still solidly second place in points I mean, he did. He didn't make up as much ground as he would like to. You know, Erickson had a pretty good. I believe Erickson came home fifth. Uh, so I mean, and again, like you said, Erickson has been quietly consistent all season. He's more often than not finished in the top ten. Um, you know, plus the double points for the win at Indy is is icing on the cake. Yeah, he's been he's been quietly putting himself on a roll. It's very it's looking like very Alex Polo esque, who finished sixth in spite of everything to where. We were wondering if Polo was even going to be in the car to, following the messy drama that we talked about last week. Yeah, but, so let's let's dig into that a little because we really didn't get any answers this week other than, you know, that everybody is both McLaren and Ganassi are both laying claim uh, to Palou. Palou won't answer the question, uh, which uh, probably smart on his part because it's going to, this is going to end up being a little bit of a, a legal drama with some lawyers looking at contracts and these sort of things there. Um, it's even led uh, Rosenquist to comment that, you know, Alex may not drive at all next year. And we've seen these sort of things with contract stuff, but I can't see, I can't see him not driving at all. You know, I think the, because if he, if he can't drive at all, that's going to destroy his stock value. You know how racing is when you're gone for a year, it can really hurt you in the long run and stock value. And also say, I'm not, well, I, I mean, super it, license it, points as well. I mean, it what can, you- it can hurt your, your, your value, but uh, we've seen other guys. Oh, Kyle Larson, um, Alan Prost, um, guys take a year layoff and come back and, and win championships. So it's not a, it's not a career killer, but it's not ideal. Not in the, it, it, as as kind of young as his career is, you know. Yeah, that's for uh, that's for that's the biggest concern because with Larson, he was able to run elsewhere to build his to rebuild his stock. Prost was already was well established. As far as Polo, he's slowly trying to establish himself as a top tier IndyCar racer. Where he is, he won the championship, but to build his first stock in case if he were to end up in Formula One, because time will tell if he does or doesn't. It's yeah, I, I, think, I think I think that Richard, um, are, are you with me in uh, uh, f- feeling that uh, Ricardo was pretty safe in that seat for 2023, but 24 is going to be a different story? Yeah, I, or, I, I think so. I, I, I don't think for one minute that, um, hmm, should we say for one minute? No, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, oh boy, <coughs> hang on. Yeah, because right, yeah, of course, Ricardo also mentioned on social media while at it that he's he has full intentions of staying in Formula One, so that pretty much eliminates him from maybe going to Formula E or Extreme E because there's also an Extreme E program McLaren is also involved in, so it's all right, yeah. And Ricardo, well, yeah, just because Ricardo says he's committed doesn't mean. Uh, but, it's going to be honored. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, but uh, uh, I mean, Zach Brown did make some comments earlier in the year uh, that they just needed to try to figure out how to get uh, Ricardo some more help or the right kind of help uh, to kind of improve his results. But but I mean, uh, you, you know, the writing's on the wall yeah. that Lando beats him pretty much every week. Yeah. But uh, mm. I, I feel like that seat is still his in 23. And, um, you know, anybody, yeah. anybody oh. else that's uh, – testing the car because uh, Palou has been promised a test. Now Herta has had his test and from all accounts, he did quite well um, in the test. And then of course, yeah, uh, I mean, award tested yeah. earlier in the year. All right, Richard, are you, are you, can, you can you I'm breathe good. now? Okay, go ahead. I can. Yeah, we can, we can edit that bit out. Sorry guys. Um, no, I, I would be extremely surprised if any of the, her to pull award group of drivers get a McLaren seat. Um, 
I just don't. I just don't see the logic behind it. Um, in a Ward and Pelos, um cases, they've had opportunities to get through the junior development program in Europe. Um, Pelo through the Formula Two ranks, and I, I don't think he had a particularly stellar Formula Two career. Um, and then you look at a Ward. Yeah, he, he went through the Red Bull program and did some super Formula races. And I think he did a couple of F2 races. But again, there's nothing spectacular there. Um, and on Colton Herter's plate, excuse me, IndyCar isn't one of those series that and, you know, you're ever going to dominate. But, you know, we said at the start of the year, if, if he was going to be the guy that stepped up, you know, he needs to be winning this championship and winning it pretty comfortably. And he's, you know, just inside the top 10, which which isn't really, um, you know, something to put on a resume for a guy that's, you know, he's young, he's quick, there's no doubt about it. But sometimes, as, you know, as we all know, there's a lot more to, to just being quick that makes a good race car driver. Um, and, yeah, I I would be... Very, very, very surprised if come 23 or 24, any of those three guys that have been going through the McLaren testing end up in a McLaren Formula 1 seat. I I can't see it happening. I can't see the logic behind it. I would fart personally. Again, I don't know the data. I don't know the insight to it. But I cannot imagine that any of those three guys are faster than Ricciardo. You know, period. Um Certainly not so, currently. Certainly not currently. No, yeah. and I, I don't see so. any of them that would be having no, you know, having the knowledge and the experience that uh, that Daniel has. Where would what would the benefit be of putting one of those guys in the car? I, <clears throat> you're going to take a step back, and then you've got to try and take, you know, you're going to take two steps back, and you've got to make three steps forward within, you know, a pretty short period of time. And I just, you know, I, I just don't understand how that's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, I, you know, the most likely scenario if Palou resolves his contract mess with Ganassi is that it's going to be Palou um, along with Award and uh, Rossi in the IndyCar. Uh, things will stay the same in Formula One and Felix will go to Formula E, although Felix is trying to make a case to save his IndyCar seat. Um, and and he, he may, in fact, do that. Uh, you know, Felix is a, a quite an accomplished driver. Um so, but let's, uh, let's talk a little more about the Toronto race. Cause we, again, we saw some problems with Chevrolet engines. We had both uh, Kirkwood and, um, oh, who was the other guy that lost an engine early on? Um, is well, well, new garden, new garden lost an engine in qualifying, had to change the engine. Um, but yeah, so it's it's kind of odd because engine failures have been really rare in IndyCar lately. But we've had these problems. Award had the problem, uh, and Kirkwood had the problem. They both they both seem to do with fuel delivery fuel delivery problems. Um, then of course uh, uh, Felix did have a, a an engine let go uh, at uh, Mid Ohio. So Richard, any insight on this? Uh, uh, fuel delivery thing is that is that a matter of uh, mapping or or is that something more internal? Um, oh, goodness me, it could be one of any many many different things. Sure, um, sure, yeah. But you I, know, it's the, very difficult to the fact that the engine, the, yeah, the fact that the engines are close to the end of their life cycle because uh, they had mentioned that most of these failures were they were close to the end of their life cycle, and you know this maybe would would have been the last race for them anyway. Is that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, these things are so damn complicated these days, and there's so many minor issues that you can, you know, you can have something very small go wrong that turns into something pretty damn big pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, I, uh, it, it's really, really, really difficult to speculate. Uh, I mean, now, at the end of the day, Chevy know what they're doing, and they make some pretty damn good engines, and the win enough races for anybody's uh, fair share. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, obviously a rough weekend for them. 
And, a rough, uh, rough, you know, rough, rough couple of weekends for them. Yeah, actually, it was well, Ke- it was Kellett. Kellett was the other guy that lost an edge at Toronto, which, yeah, which is a shame because yeah. that's that's his home crowd. Though. Yeah, it's been a rough yeah. couple of races for Foyt because they've had problems at Mid Ohio as well. And on top of the team withdrawing the eleven program, it's been rough on them in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at Kirkwood's uh, placement in the standings, it's it's nowhere indicative of the performance that he's put on in qualifying and in the races. Sometimes he's no. just he's just not managed to get to finishes. Although he's certainly shown quite a tremendous amount of speed in that in the you know the in that smaller team. Yeah, and that that was my big big reservation as to why I didn't pick him for rookie of the year at the beginning of the year because it's, the question was how would those four cars perform under his own will he's done it he just has a reliability or stuff that wasn't his own doing like a texas where he got involved in an incident like if without those he'd probably be well in in the mix for rookie of the year right now that he is and the same and thing i said, believe is about, it is it uh christian lungard leading rookie, rookie of the year right now i believe that, so that because he Lund- yeah, Lundgaard, yeah, 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 Lund- Lund- yeah, Lundgaard M- Malukas, and then I think yeah. Fran- Francesca is third in Rookie of the Year points, if I'm not mistaken. I, yeah, I think it's between Lundgaard and uh, Malukas, though. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think Fr- De Francesca is gonna creep up there, you know. Although, no. although he seems to have improved a little bit, you know. Yeah, he's slowly he's staying to keeping himself out of trouble, even though to. Ter- even though Mid Ohio was a different episode because that involved all the Andretti cards, but yeah, I, that's the thing. So for Lundgaard, as far as his quest for rookie of the year, getting a top ten has an encouraging run for him because it's been rather <coughs> mixed back. All of the rookies has, for the most part, have had strong runs. Just a couple of them haven't been able to capitalize when when they do run well. Like Ilot, that was the other guy I was going to mention. Ilot has had some potential. Ilot's, Ilot's been dynamite qualifying, yeah, more often than not. Yeah. Yeah. He's really driving better than that car should be. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that it's just, we'll see how they need to turn. At the end of the day, they need to turn around. Ford to Ford can needs to turn around, especially Kirkwood in the next few race, the next three races in two weeks. They just have to. to kind of save their season even though we know Kirkwood is capable we know what he's done with this team just in general to get out of this threat that they're dealing with for reliability and potential financial problems Yeah, you know, absolutely yeah the financial problems are never never wonderful for a team <laughs> you know and then of course Tatiana is losing the seat time as well you know she had to sit out to sit out the entire race uh weekend uh, so, and I don't know if that leads to layoff for the team members that would be working on the car there. So I don't know if that's uh, taking food off those guys' tables or not. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but, uh, yeah, overall it's just, it's not a good thing. Um, but I, as I wrap my mind around it, looking at how we are past halfway, who the biggest disappointments have been, uh, and that would be a certain Mr. Jack Harvey. And a certain Mr. Connor Daly, I, I believe, are the two biggest disappointments uh, for me this year. And these are guys that were highly touted. Um, and, and again, you know, Connor has a huge fan base from just simply for the fact that he's, you know, he's an Indiana guy, and and the 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 the, you know, the, the, the core of the fan base is in Indiana. So a lot of guys root for him, and a lot of guys have been saying, "Oh, he needs, you know, he needs a full time ride with the same team." And but yet, he really hasn't brung it other than a good run at the Indy GP. And then Jack Harvey has been nowhere this year. You know, they all expected great things when it was, you know, if he would come out from under Michael Shank racing and go to Ray Hall and, you know, the Ray Hall team, other than Graham's fourth place this week, that Ray Hall team has kind of been overall disappointing. And I don't know if that's due to their expansion uh, to three cars and it could be that they're spread a little thin, but uh, yeah, those are the two guys that I'm uh, I'm most disappointed in for me. Go go ahead, Richard. Sorry. The the rookie of the year that the, the, you know, he's the highest placed car in that camp, isn't he? I believe so. Ray Hall might be higher in overall points. I'd 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 have to look it up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Ray Hall. I, I mean, even though you don't see him battling at the front, usually he's pretty consistent finisher. So, but yeah. uh, but speaking of long losing streaks, Graham Rahal is seven years now. So yeah, it's been for yeah. We talk about Rossi and Dixon for a long time. Dixon's able to break it. 
talk about Ray Hall. But for me, most disappointing and by far, no question. You mentioned Harvard. I'm going with Groshan and Elio. I would expect Groshan to be more of a podium contender, but it's just, it, but that's not been the case at all. It just has it to be, and I expect him a lot more out of him going to a top, to a strong right like Andretti. Sure, Andretti are not quite there as they were back in 2017, 2018, when they had multiple guys going for titles. Sure, Herta has been kind of the one carrying the whole squad, but I expected a lot more out of him. So I expected him to him have a win or more podiums, but what is it right now? Still Long Beach as his lone bright point as far as with Andretti? Uh, yeah, yeah. Grosjean has been incredibly disappointing. And to your point, Elio has as well. Um, he, he's, he's consistently out qualified and, and out done in the race by his teammate. Yeah. Pa- Pagano, who seems to be driving beyond the limits of that car as well. I mean, yeah, Pagano's done fine this season. He's exactly. Like, yeah. He's we showed he's quick in practices a couple of times. Just putting a full race together. It's not quite there, but he's still make nothing out of something to where he's in good position, probably ending the year in the top 10 in points, barring any drama. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot more to discuss. So uh, let's real quick look forward to doubleheader in Iowa. Um, going to be a real nice event. Um, some uh, They got uh, some country music concerts. They've got a really great title sponsor in hy V, who's all in. I um, mean, hy V has really been great for this series. A lot of folks will post pictures of when they go into hy V stores, they have whole a whole section in your hy V grocery store with um, IndyCar merchandise, you know, with your, your Jack Harvey die cast and T-shirts and flags and, and stuff like that, which is really good to see because, you know, we've seen other partners that have been pretty good to IndyCar where you really like Target. If you walked into a Target store anytime during the whole time they were sponsoring Ganassi, you wouldn't really find much. Um, you know, you might see a little picture of Scott Dixon on a, target gift card right you might find one of the racing champions there with you know among the other toys in the toy section um you know or picture of scott dixon and dario fred Keaty on a cereal box if you remember those the vrooms vrooms cereal <laughs> but uh but but overall nothing compared to what what hyvee has done and hyvee has gone all in on getting this race and I know they're leasing the track from NASCAR. So, uh, going to be a double header. And there are a couple of guys who have performed really well at this track. And one of them is, uh, Joseph Newgarden, uh, who's, uh, also done really well this year. So, uh, what do you think, Louise, you like Newgarden for one win or two or a sweep? It's hard to say a sweep right now, but you could never cut out Newgarden. And I said, like I mentioned earlier, if he's going to bounce back from Toronto and really be that guy, the strongest guy all season, which arguably he's been all season. But if he wants to cut the gap in that championship trail over Erickson, this is the week to do it. He's got to. A uh, track he's familiar done so well. If he, like I mentioned, if he does well but not enough to cut it, it's going to be a tough challenge ahead because you got a couple races that probably will favor Ganassi a little bit. But it's a matter of how qualifying goes. Because that is key is in any track, how qualifying goes and how you capitalize on the, during the race. And there's also concern about whether will we see the pus, a slim possibility of running two races in one day or vice versa. Time will tell. <clears throat> I remember we did that once. When did we do that? Was it in Detroit? We're supposed to be doubleheader and the first day was rained out. They did the two races in one day. That's, that's, that was a that's long just, time ago to remember. Yeah, yeah, but that's a, it's a bit of a nightmare for the uh, for the crews. <laughs> but uh, but 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 either way, you got to look at uh, you know Iowa races differently than than nearly every place that they're at this year. You know, the, the laps tick off in just moments. You know, and, mm-hmm. and and you're and you're always in traffic. You know, and say you know by lap five six, you're already overhauling the back of the field if you're out front. So. Uh, new, new it's guard, like a gateway, new, isn't it? Yeah, but smaller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, smaller. Well, Phoenix, smaller. how big is it compared to Phoenix? Uh, Phoenix is a mile long, if I remember. I yeah, I, Iowa is what seven, seven eighths of a mile. Yeah, it's like they based it on Richmond. Quite uh, that's when Rusty was designing it. He wanted to make it look like Richmond, so I'd imagine it has to be less than a mile. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's less than a mile. It's not yeah, it's not like a half mile or anything, but it's uh, yeah. I think it's seven eighths. 
um, which, uh, you know, one of us could probably look that up. But uh, I, you know, you got to see it, it's going to be it's going to take a lot of luck. Right. <laughs> and, and and the yellows have to fall just your way. Uh, but more often than not, we see a guy get up front to dominate this thing. If you remember, uh, you know, Newgarden had a couple of really dominating runs. Um, Hinchcliffe had a pretty dominating run there a couple of years ago. So I, I really, other than New Garden, it's hard to kind of just grab a pick there. But this is the kind of track that the aforementioned Elio Castro Neves performed really well at, you know, during the during the IRL era when there were plenty of ovals and small ovals. And I remember uh, Elio had some really good runs at Richmond and whatnot. So uh, this could be, you know, could be an opportunity for, you know, Elio to uh, break that little jinx of, uh, of uh, having a crappy year, but um, yeah, but, th- but then then I gotta I wonder about a guy like Award, who's 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 absolutely fearless and has quick hands, you know, and he's he's looking for a good result. He's had a couple of disappointing uh, races in a row, so um, yeah, it's uh, so maybe I'll say Award for one and Elio for the other. Richard, what do you think? Uh, poo, I don't know about the win, but I think uh, I think Grosjean could have a r- good run. I know we sort of mentioned it earlier as having struggled so far this year, which he probably has. But you know, you you, you, you look at you point the finger at Grosjean for struggling, but I think the whole Andretti team has uh, struggled there, so it's maybe a little bit unfair to sort of single uh, single his performances out. But um, you know, you, yeah, you are uh, Dixon again bounces, goes back to back, and really turns on the heat in the championship. And Pillow gets a win as well. There we go. Dixon and Pillow. There you go. All right. So now, Louise, now where, who did you settle on? I said it's tough to say New Garden winning both yeah, I was, was going to say, we left you New Garden if you want them. Yeah, I'm going to go with New Garden for race number one. And race number two, I'm going to go with Pato. Okay. All right. Sounds good, buddy. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, let's move on to New Hampshire, where... Um, NASCAR, we have our 14th winner of the year. Uh, we had, we had talked about what we see, uh, you know, more winners this year. And indeed we did. And it was not one of the people we mentioned. It was Christopher Bell, as a matter of fact, who uh, uh, bested uh, Chase Elliott there towards the end. So um, good run for Bell. Um, it gets him a spot in the playoffs. But uh, what were your impressions of the race overall? And I we say this for now because we're talking about 14 winners. And if I were Ryan Blaney and Martin Truex Jr., specifically Blaney, you got to find a way to point. You get strong results. Hope for lo- hope for bad performances from Elliott and Chastain to go for that regular season title, and bank on maybe winning the regular season title. And ca- and and if there's other winners, but you win a regular season title then you're in because that you guarantee yourself a spot. Christopher Bell winning allowed it. It's a surprising on paper to some on paper, but when you look at his runs in Xfinity, he's won three excluding this year because he didn't compete this year. He won the last three races at Loudon in a row in Xfinity. So you'd expect him to do well in the cup level at the end of magic mile. And he was able to do so. And that puts this playoff format into a situation that we haven't seen before for guys like Mark Trix Jr., Ryan Blaney may not make the postseason if they don't win. We still have Daytona in August. The big circle is Daytona. We still have Watkins Glen, Michigan, Pocono. We have those races coming up. Anything could happen in those. So for guys, so and tracks that have been relatively kind for Harvick and Truex and Blaney. Blaney is the one Michigan at Daytona last year. But if I were Blaney, you got to go in the mindset of winning because I don't see Elliott or Chastain stop ha- having bad runs at this point. Not counting Daytona because Daytona, anybody could get watered up. And then uh, the Daytona, Cody Ware yeah, or Randy, yeah, I mean, Corey LaJoy would win. Yeah, Daytona, anybody can win, too, and then take another playoff spot. So that's that's really the concern that uh, Blaney and Harvick and, and Truex need to have there. You, I mean, you got – you're talking once we get back at Daytona, right? You got uh, – you look at the um, the Keselowski, um, the Roush team there. They did, they did so well at the uh, the race early in the season. You know, Brad could 
pull a win out of nowhere, you know, despite the fact he's having a relatively rough season. He actually had an okay day at uh, Loudon, finished sixth, but he, he could snatch a win out of thin air. Uh, so good his teammate Chris Busher, you know, or, you know, uh, any number of guys can. Bubba Wallace has, you know, won at uh, a plate race before. Yeah. He, he can pull one out. Yeah. So, or even the aforementioned Corey LaJoy on a match. He's going to go into Daytona even more determined than ever to get himself in there. But first things first, he needs to get himself in the top 30. That's for he's in trouble in that, in that, in that situation. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. LaJoy is needs, you know, not just the win, but also pretty, pretty strong closeout to the regular season. Yeah. And for guys like those who need to get on it, look at Ty, Kyle, Kyle Bush is in, but to build his stock for next year, because there's still no deal, no contract extension for him or guys like Ty Dillon that <laughs> needs to clean his act together because he's made Alex Bowman and Austin Hill irate in two different divisions. Well, didn't, didn't did we just announce that Ty Dillon is not returning to, uh, no, that Fed, was, uh, I think that was GMS, yeah. a few days after our recording last week. I believe it was Thursday or Friday. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was long. Yeah. That was, so this is the first time we're mentioning on we're mentioning Ty Dillon's 2023 status here, uh, which is unemployed at the moment. Yeah. So uh, having a bad week overall where he may drive his fellow peers, I rate, especially Austin Hill in the Xfinity level where who knows potential team. He might join, even though he said in the past, he wants to build his own craft, but in case how the domino effects fall on a lap, he could end up there. You never know. But a week like he had allowed in, not not ideal at all. He's been out of the he's been out of a full out of cup full time once. So if you fall out of a cup deal twice, it's very, very difficult to get back there a third chance unless you're Todd Bodine. And Todd Bodine, who never really set the world on fire in cup to begin with. Guy was no. good at, guy was good in trucks though. I'll give him that. Trucks and Bush because he yes was, yes yeah see that's why I call his NASCAR career a ping pong effect. And speaking of Todd Bodine, he'll make his 800th NASCAR start, his final truck race of the year in Pocono. Right, and we are headed to Pocono. So, mm -hmm. I mean, who do you kind of like for Pocono? It's historically been Denny Hamlin's playground in the past. Um. He's won once a couple of there. Um, Harvick could run well there. I, you know, I don't, it's hard to, it seemed like the Fords overall are, have kind of like taken a step back to the Toyotas lately and the, and the Chevys even. So, I mean, since the beginning of the year where the Fords were doing well. So, sorry, 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 it's hard to say that, I'm uh, you know, good Harvick, Harvick could pull one out. I'm trying to I'm trying to ponder if I like Harvick's chances at Pocono or do I want to go with a safe bet on Chase Elliott because you're looking at Pocono has been historically kind to those that have done well on road courses in the past. So you look at Trackhouse maybe being a strong contender there. But I feel like right now the momentum is favoring Elliott. He's had the more stronger runs in the last few races. And I think it's going to continue at Pocono. If you look at Chase's stats for the whole year, he's, he's about leading all the drivers in, in nearly every stat. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. hard. It's hard to bet against Chase. Yeah. Especially particularly at a place like Pocono. Yeah. A track that his dad has been very successful as well. So another track he's able to win where his dad has been able to do well. Won't hurt. Won't hurt. Yeah. So, and that for sure will really make him as the title favorite if he hasn't been already. Because right now, it's the debate is either going to be Chase or Ross at season's end. If Elliott were able to get a win, that's going to put him a step further over Shastain as far as being the, the favorite to win the cup going into the playoffs. Yeah. So, so you're picking Chase Elliott. Mm -hmm. All right. That leaves me to pick. I don't know. Pocono's Pocono's an odd little track, but uh, I'll say uh, Truex ever won in Pocono? 
I believe yes, yes he they did. May have. So I'm gonna go with True X because I, I just wanna I actually want to see us get to 16 winners and then see how that dynamic plays out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with True X there. And uh Richard, um, you're gonna abstain from picking yeah. up sure. Yep. All right. So uh with that being said, let's talk about where NASCAR is gonna go next year on the fourth of July, which is downtown Chicago was announced earlier today. Um, and you know, it's been rumored for a while. And it's the, the you know, street course right there goes right down uh, Lakeshore Boulevard, you know, close to the Field Museum and Soldier Field. Um, and in my mind, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an uninspired course. It's uh, uh, most of the 12 turns are 90 degree turns. It's 2.2 miles. Um, I'm not sure how narrow it's going to be uh, once we get the, the walls and fencing and whatnot in there. But uh, yeah, it's... It's I hate the fact that it's coming at the expense of Road America, which uh, had that date, um, because I think, you know, Road America is a wonderful place to hold the race. And of course, NASCAR has not released their full schedule. So this is not to say that Road America may not be on that schedule somewhere. uh, But the popular opinion is that this Chicago race replaces Road America. But it is the first real street race for cup i mean i know they've done a few things with like the west and west they had one in los angeles years and years ago uh but this is the first you know top top level cup series street race and again i hate to say this but i believe it when i see it you know because because we've we've seen some of these grand plans uh, for the larger cities uh, you know, Boston and Baltimore and uh, New York City, uh, where things have just fallen through uh, due to you know bureaucratic red tape and local opposition and those sort of things there. So I, I don't, you know, uh, I, I, I know Chicago is a very political city. There's a lot of hands to grease, uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully they'll grease the right ones and actually pull this thing off. But but I'm just I'm a little pessimistic as whether they can pull this off or not. But I know they've been planning it for a while. So yeah, and, and, go ahead. it's just and I'm with you in that regard, because it's like IndyCar open wheel fans in general. Are, they know that they know it's like if you know, you, you know, or deals. You mentioned all those cities because it's an affected card, IndyCar, Formula One and so on. And I mentioned Formula E as well. It's, it's, here's the thing when it comes to it. If it comes to the expense of Road America, it'll be a shame in that regard because I know how it's going to be sort of similar to where when Portland replaced Watkins Glen in the IndyCar calendar, pretty much killed the new the Northeast vibe of IndyCar race that's been there for nearly a century at that point over a century because the northeast is now a largely absent market for indy cars uh, not largely absent totally far, absent totally absent yeah you, you, you know what i mean yeah. but it was just a shame because they should be at pocono or Watkins Glen, in my opinion or hell if they want to try it again one more time and it flows loud it but that's a whole nother animal and another topic we can talk about later in the year. But yeah, yeah. Loud, loud actually wasn't a bad wasn't a bad IndyCar race, you know. No, it's just and, the, and, when and, they had it, it was just bad. Everything felt everything just fell flat on their face, and that's all on officiating and the weather. Yeah, and, and another, you know, and another one that I kind of enjoyed up in that market, other than Nazareth, which is not possible to race in Nazareth now, was the um, Grand Prix at the Meadowlands. That, that that snaked around Giant Stadium, you know, between Giant Stadium and Continental Airlines Arena back in the 80s. I thought that was a, a, a decent race. You know, it was a parking lot race, but, uh, you know, that was a bit of the rage in the that time there because you had, you know, Formula One race and then Caesars Palace parking lot and, and these sort of things. But, uh, again, it's it's a good way to break that New York market. Um you know, because like they that proposed Grand Prix of New Jersey, they were going to have uh, across the, the the river. That never happened again. Bureaucratic red tape. But you get on a, you know, a parking lot race. You know, where you're not taking up neighborhoods and closing city streets. You know, it could it could happen again. I don't know. I I don't. Yeah. Time. Yeah, I, I, I I don't see. It's probably probably pretty expensive uh, venture. But uh, yeah, but there is a definite huge gap in the Northeast for for IndyCar, right? 
Yeah, time will tell in that regard. But yes, you brought up another point you brought up is the Southwest tour and the Winston West, mostly emphasizing Southwest. They've done it in LA. They even done it in Spokane and Tacoma and other parts of the city. Look at IMSA GT as well. They've done it. In that is another note. IMSA will also be a part of the NASCAR week yet. So it makes you wonder that how this impact IndyCar, when you look at the IMSA paddock, they, you, I, there's a good chunk of the IndyCar folks that also does stuff for IMSA as well. So that pretty much, if anything else, depends on which IMSA divisions are coming. If the big ones are there, like DPI and all those stuff, you're talk, then we're, you, you're looking at that 4th of July weekend that's had IndyCar races for a long, long time being largely absent, I'd imagine. So we'll see what which IMSA category are going to show up. I'd imagine it might be Michelin Pilot Challenge, if anything, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. And, and again, but I believe like the, the Gen 7 car um, and, and Richard, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. The Gen 7 car is probably better suited for a street course than any previous iteration of a NASCAR uh, cup car we've had before. Do you, you feel like that? Because it's, it's closer to like an IMSA car. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they are very, uh, very, very close to, you know, on the IMSA prototype cars. I mean, the only reason that, um, um, the, you know, the only reason they're not running an IMSA body kit is basically to maintain that, that stock car configuration. Um, fundamentally, you know, you, you go away from a steel frame to a carbon fiber frame and the suspension geometry is almost identical. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was reading a lot of social media comments today after the announcement, and, and uh, you know, there are a resounding number of people who say, oh, no, stock cars aren't suited for I'm like, well, I'd, do you not know the specs of the new car? You know, there's a guy who said, oh, the IMSA cars are get around fine, but stock cars aren't designed for that. I'm like, it, you, you really, you, you don't know what you're talking about there. So, and the other bulk of the comments was everybody's concerned about the, the fact that Chicago has a crime rate that's 67%. Uh, higher than the rest of the country <laughs> so but uh, but i imagine there'll be plenty of security in in, in place i don't you know people are making it out well, to if be... you look at the crime statistics there's at least three nascar tracks in zip codes that have a higher crime rate than the zip code this uh, chicago race is going to mm. i'd love to know what they are if you could oh st louis is definitely one um, oh, okay that doesn't surprise me Oh, that was fine when I was there. Um, I'd have to find out the other list, but there's definitely another two in terms of zip code that were higher than uh, than Chicago. So, you know, it's just people bleating about this for the sake of bleating, really, and not yeah. really knowing. Oh, yeah, yeah. People, yeah. For they're, me, for they're me say, yeah, the, they're people trying to be, be funny, saying the drivers need bulletproof vests and, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, Oh, they said the street gangs will take the tires off the cars faster than the pit crews. You know, I, you know, just yeah. Just, where, where's where's NASCAR based? Hmm? Where's, where's NASCAR it? based? Out Carolinas. Exactly. Yeah, deep south. Yeah, yeah, and here's the thing. Like here's, northern, my northern my <laughs> yeah my <laughs> reservation is not much at the expense. Of, it's just the concept of being in Chicago, like the Chicago, a big market. Will the question is is will it last long term and that's the always the, the big question we always talk about here the street courses in its novelty will it succeed in the first year but the most important will it do well the second year if it goes into plan that's the thing we're looking at nashville in a couple of weeks will it deliver the second year to where people come back for a third year and so on and so forth sure i mean historically like racing street racing has thrived in like more medium-sized markets like saint Pete. here we go St. Pete or, sorry, Tor sorry. or Toronto. Mm -hmm. So, sorry to interrupt, sorry. But the three tracks that have, uh, are in a zip code with a higher crime rate than the zip code of the Chicago race, are Gateway, Nashville, and Indy, all have higher violent crime rates than uh, where Chicago is going to be. Yeah, and that Chicago race is, you know, it's in the, it's in the tourist area. You know, is there by, by the city park, by the, you know, it's not in, it's not in the hood. You know, so, but uh, people just like to think of Chicago as the crime capital of the world, much to the dismay of people in Detroit who lost that title. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, and I guess what? And we're going back to downtown Detroit. See, if they lost the title, I'm guessing that's let's see her right. That's the motor of why they're going back. The crimers have dropped <laughs> yeah. to Detroit. Let's have an IndyCar race. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Anyways, but 
I'm just curious how it's going to go. Yeah, we've never seen a street quarters. I've always came into the minds like when that day comes, it better be, it better deliver big time. If it doesn't, then, oh man, how, how they're going to recover. The biggest thing is how you mentioned about security is how they're going to treat from a, this is from a photographer's point of view, how they're going to go about with street court, street course racing, temporary street course. And they're going to, are there going to be like all oh, like any like IMSA and IndyCar open mining or linear? They're going to be very strict and restri- and only X Y Z gets all access and nobody else. And that is that's my big big question always. In yeah, when it comes yeah, to new always. Venues. Yeah, when it comes to new venues, yeah, are they gonna are they gonna let you in? Or are they gonna say no? Getty gets all the shots. Yeah, and so. that's and that's my big apprehensive thought going into that. It's going into Chicago. Because like, like IndyCar, like the folks, the street courses, those who have shot IndyCar and all that, they used to look into it and consider it's like, okay, you have experience shooting street courses, you're you're you could be accepted, you're you're good to go and all that. Because it's what, what the beauty of street course racing, you get to catch certain unique shots you don't get to anywhere else. And that's why I love street course racing when it comes to when it comes from a photographer point of view. The racing varies; it honestly varies to be honest, depending on the discipline, depending on the track, and depending on what kind of car it, it comes to mind. And and that is key. And also another thing, if you really want to win the hearts of Chicago over, you got to go all in with the entertainment. We always talk about entertainment being fine, like Iowa. Entertainment is the motive of bringing the people. Uh, High V understands that. they are promoting it as such. Gateway has done the same. Nash- so would- Nashville done the same too. They got huge, uh, huge names acts for the Nash the Music City Grand Prix. Yeah, so yeah, it's how NASCAR does it. it because what they did with the Clash, they, it was pretty good start. But I felt like they could have gone the extra mile in that, and hopefully in the twenty three Clash they do. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got to, you know, take a a, a page from the playbook of Long Beach, who, who have always made that thing. It's not just a race, but you know, weekend long festival. With with uh, you know all kind of different events and vendors and entertainment and 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 just the, the street party atmosphere and Toronto has done well with that uh, in the past. I don't know how what the vibe was this year. Uh, wasn't up there, but uh, you know in the past it's been very similar to to a Long Beach vibe with it just you know and and Nashville did a great job with that too. Even though the race kind of was <laughs> a little bit of a struggle to, to get it going uh, with, with the, the constant restarts and yellows, the, uh, the vibe and the, and the atmosphere was a lot of fun. Yeah, it certainly was. It, uh, it's a shame that I won't be able to be there this time around to see the year, how year two goes. I will not discuss in the, in the discussion as to what's going on there for now, but we'll see how it, oh, I'm just curious to see how it goes for year two, but for Chicago, they got to go all in. If they got to bring, they're going, obviously you'll see MJ. If you bring some Cubs, White Sox, Bears, CM Punk, then you get maybe people to be the kind of intrigue. You got to bring the the vibe of Chicago in, in a positive way to the people. Just like, okay, this is worth it. We can support this. If you have like a long gap between a session and qualifying, like at Portland and the Clash, that you, you got to fix that. Yeah, and, and the other thing they, they really need to do is they, they really need to slam dunk uh, when it comes to ticket sales because I, I imagine this is this one is going to be very expensive and it'll probably take them at least three years to uh, recoup the costs uh, till they start making money. So this is one that they really need to sustain, uh, you know, because you, there's numerous stories of, uh, you know, promoters who have just gone under trying to put on a street race for, for one or two years and, not able to sustain it so but we've got a few minutes left and we do want to talk about formula one a little bit and i understand that uh, uh the the folks at mercedes are a little upset that uh you know the performance gap between uh ferrari and red bull and them is is making the racing boring i, I guess it wasn't yeah. boring but i guess it wasn't boring when the mercedes was winning every race huh oh, of course not no <laughs> i think yeah. where he's coming from is that outside of red bull ferrari and Mercedes only once we've seen someone the other one of the other seven teams score a podium that is McLaren just one time. I right, but, yeah, but, but how but, has that been different from any other year? 
I mean, are you, are you don't I don't do, know. But I, just, I don't know. Uh, but, 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 parody of the last couple of years on the podium would like seven teams at best gaining podiums in one year. I, I think it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, Mercedes is, is just not thrilled that they're not winning week in and week out because everything is fine with them when they're winning. Uh, well, no, even though it's not, they always complain about how horrible their car is. So, but we're off to Paul Ricard. Um, yep. and, and the Mercedes ha- and, and the Mercedes have been improving, uh, week in and week out and doing better. Uh, so who do you like for Ricard? I mean, R- Ricard, as boring as it can be, put on a pretty good show last year. Yeah, last year wasn't a bad race, was it? I mean, I think I, I, I quite like Ferrari again, quite like Leclerc. I think if they can uh, maintain that tire performance that they showed in uh, in Austria uh, a couple of weeks ago, they'll be in a really, really strong position. Uh, I think Mercedes, you know, after bad mouthing Mercedes a little bit there, I think they will be strong. Um, I think they, uh, you know, it's a flatter track. There's less um, areas or, you know, for them to... Uh, to to come unstuck with their their, their bouncing effect uh, or porting, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, I, 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 if you're going to pick a winner, you you, you look at Leclerc. I think. All right, and Louise, who do you like? Hmm. I think it's going to be tough against going. I'm going to go with Paris. He capitalized for what he did last year, but puts it all together and gets the. The, the stunning W. I know it's surprising saying a stunning W since he's in the top three in the world championship, but I say he builds from what happened, builds from last year and capitalizes it here. Okay. And y'all left me Max, so I'll take him. I'll take Max for <laughs> Circuit Paul Ricard. So uh, with, with that being said, we are just about out of time. So, um, Louise, any final thought for the night? Final thoughts. If I were Rockingham Speedway, I would not vent your frustration on social media. Just saying. <laughs> because yes, you I, have a, you have a today, sustainable yeah. track that you can host a national touring event. Saying that, uh, they'll find a way to put it against you. Trust me. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, because Rockingham, they repaved the thing. They, they put some money into it. Oh, my God, they, they, you know, they can hold, uh, you know, super modifieds or or they, they can get Arca in there. Yeah, they're 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 not they're not getting a cup date. I hate to tell you that the, 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 the that boat has sailed. So. All right, Richard, you got a final thought for us? Uh, yeah, everybody try try not to stay at the track at Paul Ricard for too long. It will induce hypnosis. <laughs> yeah, it will. <laughs> Looks like a spirograph. So, all right. So, I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network. I want to thank uh, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. I want to thank Dan Blay Racing Art and Mark Dill and Legend of the First Super Speedway. I want to thank you, Richard. I want to thank you, Louise. And I want to thank you, folks, who listen to us every week. But until next week, good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-B-A-